Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Leah. It's exciting to be here and exciting to have this panel. Um, as Leah said, I'm Sam Hermit with the Texas Water Development Board. Um, and first, I want to give a super brief introduction to my three distinguished panelists. Uh, first to my left is Ashley Gruder, Director of Research and Water Conservation at the Harris-Galveston Subsidence District. And next is Joe Yelderman, Professor and Geosciences Department Chair at Baylor University. And then on the end is Amy Bush, hydrologist for RMBG Geo. And if you want to know more gory details about any of them, feel free to look in the conference pamphlet or on the app. Um, also, before getting started, there will be Q&A at the end, so jot down your questions. Uh, we want to make sure that this stays exciting and we keep our panelists on their toes, so make them good ones. Um, and now let's get started. Uh, without further ado, this panel is entitled People and Purpose, and it's focused on water data. Um, and most folks, when you talk about data, they don't think like, ooh, that's really sexy and provocative. Amy does, and our previous speaker does, and I know Justin Thompson is here somewhere, and I know he does, but outside of those folks, generally, those aren't the adjectives that come to mind. I know they're not for my kids. Oftentimes, folks are like, oh, it's confusing, it's boring. So I want to challenge our panelists to put on their salesperson hats and give us a few sentences to really sell our audience and get all of you hooked in on water data. So I'll start with you, Ashley. How, how are you going to sell it to our audience? Okay, so I believe that the groundwater and water data in general is essential for life. Um, we need water to survive, so being able to know where that data is so we can adequately have enough supply to meet current demand but also future demand, I think it kind of sells itself. Awesome. All right, Joe, you're up. Well, I know most of you have heard the old saying that uh, you can't manage something you don't measure. Uh, I would add that uh, you can't manage it well if you don't measure it accurately. And so I think good data and data that's understandable and communicates to the, the uh, consumers or the people that make decisions is critical to managing our water. Excellent. I say if you want to affect change, you have to make people care. And if you want people to care, they have to understand what's going on. And if you want them to understand what's going on, you have to be able to show them your data in a way they can understand it. So I think water data is the gateway to change. Awesome. That's perfect. And that's a great setup uh, for my first question, which is for you, Amy, um, which is that, you know, if anybody can sell folks on water data, I think that's a really good pitch that you just put out there. And now you actually get the chance to illustrate it because as you're saying, you know, you need to be able to show people and the idea of data just being a verbal exercise that doesn't really work An image is worth a thousand words. So you have a few slides. Can you kind of talk us through um, that process? Absolutely. So I think the first slide they're going to put up um, is basically the anti-salesman pitch. And it is the backbone of what we have to build everything on. It's, it's, um, it's the data. It's the data we need, but it doesn't do any good like this. Um, we can give you a little bit better idea here with some averages and some charts and some, you know, some lines and some centering and make things a little bit more readable. Or I can give you a little bit of a picture and we can say, oh, look, this is what's happening. It's easy to understand in one little spot. This is what's happening right here. But if you really want to affect change, you have to give people a grasp of what's going on in a larger area in a way that affects them. And so if you can put this up in front of somebody and say, red, bad, blue, good, and maybe I should have put a red star on there like the, the little maps at the zoo or the mall that says you are here. And I'm not trying to talk down to anybody, but literally, if you can't sell this in 30 seconds, people lose interest. You have to put it in front of them, they have to understand it, and they have to, to grasp easily what's going on and why they should care. Yeah, I, I think you just illustrated that super well, uh, because the difference between your first slide, oh, if you click one more time, yeah, I think we get the stack of them all flowing together. There we go. 
And so the process that you've described is really the transformation of raw data into usable information. And that's really critical. And that's what we're talking about today is this transition from raw data. Um, can you click us one more, Joe, since you're the driver? Perfect. Okay, we'll hold that up for just a second while we talk to Ashley about um, the advanced metering infrastructure that your district is working on right now with a few different grantees. Um, how will the data that's available through your AMI system allow for the kind of transformation that Amy just talked us through, and how will that really actually bring some new power and control to the people who are in your district? Yes, so the district has a water conservation program, and part of that we have a grant program where we request applications f from people within Harris and Galveston counties to have projects that conserve water. Recently, this year, we had three of the grantees that were awarded was the city of Friendswood, the city of Galveston, and the city of Webster, and they focused on AMI as part of their project. So what they're going to do is install and deploy these new smart meters on all of their connections. Um, not only will this improve meteor accuracy for them, which is great as operators, but it will also enable the, their customers to be have access to a portal. So this can be on a website or on an app where they will get real-time data of their water usage. And part of this is hoping to educate the general public on how much water they're actually using, because many maybe don't quite know. Um, but it also gives them and operators a chance to notify customers, say, if the water's been flowing for an extended period of time, say 24, 48 hours, their system can send out notifications to those specific specific consumers and letting them know, hey, you may have a leak here. So this could be an, a great opportunity to have some sort of uh, leak detection and use AMI as a water conservation tool. Um, so this will be done by the grantees. Uh, we at the district, we won't be holding any of this data or doing that communication, although we will be having our Smarter About Water tool on their portal. So other people can see additional tools to conserve water. And then from those grantees, we're actually collecting um, data from them. So right from when they install, and most of them have already been deploying, we will get five years of past data of their water usage and then five years of future uses so we can have further science and research projects about quantifying that and maybe having a calculation to, for AMI for everyone to, to realize and take advantage of. That sounds like a great program. Do you think you'll be trying to expand the AMI out to more in your district over time? That is a goal of what we're doing with the data that we're collecting. We haven't had anything like that quite yet, but we're hoping to expand in, in that direction so we can show to other operators in other cities that this is a great tool for water conservation in our area. Awesome, thank you. All right, Joe, professor, you're up. Um, so the focus of your work is really interesting in that it's really on the human element of water data and how those data can lead to behavior change, which is actually also what Ashley was just describing that you know may come about after AMI and folks learn how they're using their water more clearly. Um, and that's the kind of connection that we're trying to illustrate here is between the people and the data and how you actually get those pieces to work. So can you walk us through, you have a couple of slides, and describe how you go from data to behavior change to aquifer impacts? I hope so. <laughs> Me too, because uh, otherwise it'd yeah, be awkward. Uh, yeah. So, so the first thing I'd say is uh, I gave a, a talk a number of years ago that was entitled uh, a, um, a Picture's Worth a Thousand Graphs. And I think it's a little bit like that, but I'm going to start out by showing you a graph. And uh, this is give a little background to what we did. Um, this shows uh, uh, actually two graphs. One is a, a, a yellow or orange line that's above a, a blue line. And you can see they're quite a bit different, even though they have the similar pattern. And the one on the top is a quarterly monitored by hand monitor well that was probably donated or volunteered uh, for an agency that's monitoring those, wa the, those things. And the other one is an amalgamation of actually active wells being used within a development area that's experiencing some groundwater uh, drawdown. And you see that they have a similar pattern, but there's a lot more detail in the one below. And so what we did was we sent these kinds of graphs out over time for about a year, uh, and we did a survey before and after to see if, how, how people were understanding this. And so here's a, just a, a sample of a couple of the results. 
And the first one you see is that uh, some people didn't even know there was a monitor well uh, in their area. Uh, and after a while, more people knew, but we still had a significant amount of people that still weren't aware. And part of that was that we sent these out before and after to addresses and uh, people that lived at those addresses changed. And so you always have people that don't know. Uh, and so that's a group you're trying to communicate with. The next slide uh, shows uh, kind of surprising. We said, well, do you think your well, if you're monitoring your own well, is a better representation of your aquifer than a, a designated monitor well somewhere else around the area? And, and it was kind of split, and some people didn't know. Uh, after follow-up and we uh, the mail-outs and the, the information we provided them, the, uh, the groups were m more people had an opinion, but they were still just as opinionated one way or the other. And uh, so what did we learn from this? Well, I think the take-home is that we're all trying up here to get this information out. As Amy said, you've got to communicate to the people that are using the, these data and this water. And we really don't know how to communicate well. Uh, with data and with information to the public and to the users. And, and I will give one quick example, then I'll stop, and that is we recently in the drought had water restrictions in uh, Waco, and uh, they, after the first few weeks of the water restrictions, which were, went to a two-day watering cycle, uh, the city used much more water than they were using before. And that's because people reacted very differently than what the intent of the restrictions were for. We don't know how to get people to uh, do the things that they need to do with their water uh, with the data we use or the systems we try to employ. So I'll stop there. Well, and Joe, I'm curious, since you're a professor, so presumably have the ability to have very low paid graduate labor, are you looking into doing any research on solving that question? Because that's huge. How do we, how do we actually, because it's really interesting looking at um, your graphs, y'all are looking up there, I'm looking down here. You know, the, like you said, the yes, no, people, more people had an opinion, but they were still just as divided. So how do we actually uh, make that transition to actually the information being better understood to lead to more effective decision making? That's a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, we're just, we're studying it and trying to figure it out. It's a complex si uh, situation. I think what Amy has discovered, you know, it, using the spatial data is much more helpful. Uh, you know, spreadsheets are good for accountants and, and things, but they're not very good at communicating to the people that are using them. And so we just, we don't understand water, but we're young. I mean, we've only been doing this a few decades now with groundwater districts and, and managing groundwater in Texas. So I have high hopes that we're on the right path. Awesome. I appreciate your optimism. It is shared. Okay, so Ashley, circling back to you, your district has a lot of data and is known around the state for being data rich and doing a lot of research. Um, there are clearly benefits to stakeholders from that work, and you described some of them before, but data can also benefit your own staff and reduce workloads. Can you tell us about your well radius tool uh, specifically and how that has benefited both the district's personnel and the public? Yes, so kind of along the lines of what Amy and Joe have already said, um, in the past, we have a permitting software that we used. It was called PTS, but it was very separate from um, mapping software like Esri ArcGIS. So when we would have members of the public would come and request this well radius report where essentially they are picking a well, they defined the, the radius of what they want, of how many wells fall within that radius, and specific well data with owner, um, the depth, and things like that. They'd have to go on our website and fill out a form, and then our staff would then review that form and then email it back to the requester. Um, now we have transitioned to a new permitting software called CityWorks, which has been fabulous for the district. We've been able to integrate that Esri, that mapping software, with our permitting software. Um, and by doing so, we were able to leverage some efficiencies within the Esri programs, for example, ArcGIS Online is a great service for the community to use, and we have an account as part of our license. So when we migrated and transitioned to CityWorks, we were able to use some applications within our ArcGIS Online account 
to deliver this well radius report in a whole new way. So as the graphs and, and tables that were being shown by Amy earlier, that's how the report would come out to the public if they had a well radius request. Now we have an interactive map where they see that geospatially and they can zoom in and interact with the data and they still have a tool on that map to get them that report, say, if they need to submit it to other agencies and have an official report by us. But we've given them the power to access that data in real time 24-7 without having staff review. So it's really increased efficiencies for administratively for staff um, and also benefits the public to be able to see it whenever they want. Awesome. And have you had any concerns with privacy around well data and that being accessible? Right, so we are a public agency, so the well data, if anyone requests, we would be able to provide. Um, but we, as part of what we have on our AGO well, it is hosted. So there are certain aspects of the well data that we still restrict and do keep private. So we had consultants come and give us these fancy queries on the back end, so we were able to deliver and, and publish those services on the front end. Um, so there still is some privacy involved, but it is still public data. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I think that kind of tiered access is an important component of the water data space and understanding that even though data are public, that doesn't mean that all data need to be aired out all the time. Um, Amy, so similar question to you, because you also have uh, a lot of, do a lot of different studies and research, and you know well how the data can impact staff and can impact districts. And I know you've worked with multiple districts that have changed how they operate based on the data that you've been able to provide them, which is exactly you know, what we wanna think about is how is decision making, how can decision making be improved through data? So how did you turn the data into information that impacted decision making and was that like a smooth sailing, easy peasy kind of process? Everything or was it in the groundwater world is smooth sailing. We all know this. <laughs> so th this, this happens at a lot of levels. And, and the thing that people think about, I think is probably, um, okay, can I get this in front of my board and my board can make a decision to change policy. And that does happen. We have a district that looked at one of these maps and said, ooh, we have a really bad problem. We're gonna implement metering. We're gonna implement production limits. That's a very straightforward thing. It did not happen straightforwardly in real life. <laughs> but that's a very straightforward, you know, cause-effect relationship. But we've also had things happen like, okay, well, I need you to evaluate if I'm meeting my DFCs. Okay, well, let's look at your data. Your data can't tell us if you're meeting your DFCs. Are you measuring the right thing? Are you measuring enough of it? Are you measuring it in the place where you have the DFC set? You know, things break down early on sometimes, and, it, and that tells us something too. And that makes changes also at a whole different level. <laughs> But then, it, you know, then people are, are prepared to move to the next thing. Um, and then we have a million things daily that I think that people kind of forget in things like um, management plans and, and things like that where we're having to quantify how many of something are we going to measure, how many are, you know, and, and you need to be able to answer those questions. We're not even trying to, you know, do a big analysis. How many wells did you measure last year? Do you have to go and count? pages on a piece of paper that you, there's faster and better ways to do this. And, and I think most people are past that at this point, but those types of questions are very important on a day-to-day -day operation to the staff who are having to make those calls and they need to have that information available quickly and efficiently so that, so that the people on the ground can use it. And then, and then you can get to the point where you are presenting things to a board and they can make those policy decisions that really matter. Can you give us an example of one of the sort of shifts in decision making that has happened that you've been a part of? My second job in the groundwater world was as a district manager. I was a nerd for 10 years and then I was a district manager for a few years. And I walked in and a lady uh, was a manager and she was a fantastic woman. And she said, you need to get a dog. And I said, oh, okay, why? And she said, you're gonna be bored to tears at this job. And I was standing in her office looking at the wall where there was a map from the 50s with push pins in it and that's how they were doing permitting. I left in three years with a database in place and a GIS program in place and all of the uh, you know, permitting and measuring and monitoring was available immediately, readily, if somebody walked in the door and everything we needed to do was, was there and, and at our fingertips. 
That's a three-year shift. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's you personally modernizing the data space in that particular context, which is commendable. I also got a dog. You did, excellent. <laughs> what did you name but the not, dog? Not a little bit, but it wasn't, for the, it wasn't because I was bored. But I did, she was right, I did need a dog. She was right about that. <laughs> I think most everybody needs a dog. <laughs> All right, thanks, Amy. Um, Joe, so we've had good examples from Ashley and Amy about transforming raw data into usable information and connecting that to more informed decision making. Texas's population is growing by the day. We heard Jeff describe that before. We know that our natural resources are limited and they're strained further during drought conditions like the conditions that we're experiencing now, most of the state. To what extent is the nexus of drought, population growth, and limited resources a policy conundrum versus a data conundrum? Yes. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I know that she said, right, you told me to be brief. So that was, uh, no, you know, I think it's both. And, and I, think, I think there's still a big data problem. And I will give two examples of that. Amy brought up the fact that wells are point source data. And so you can make them geospatial. But we are, most of our data sets are irrigation wells, municipal wells, big wells. And the real data that's out there that's got spatial aspects to it are all the domestic wells, the exempt wells, if you will. And, and that's a, there's thousands of them, and we have no data on a lot of them. So I think that's something we've got to address. And on the surface water end that, that's connected to groundwater is base flow in streams. I think many of our streams that are drying up result of not just the drought, but due to human use that, and population growth and so forth that's caused that. Uh, we have uh, monitoring on mainstream rivers and not our upper reaches of the little smaller stream, just anecdotal, oh, it's been dry for a long time. And so we need to monitor and find a way to, to look at that. I think the USGS and others are starting to look at that, but that's a challenge for groundwater districts as well as we have a base flow to our streams. And so would you say that policy needs to change to get us making those, you know, doing more monitoring, uh, doing more with the data that we have? Do we need policy to direct us to do that? Or do we need the additional data, which will then tell us through the data, how policy should change? I, I don't know that I really know the answer to that, but I will say this is that we can't, uh, one of the problems sometimes is we try to do one thing really, really well, and we don't have a lot of data. We need to look at monitoring systems that are inexpensive and that are more extensive, and therefore I, we can get the data that then to make some decisions on policy. Uh, but uh, I heard some talks earlier today that talked about you know, even though we can call them aquifers in a big general sense, some aquifers are not all one connected piece. They're not all the same everywhere. And so a lot of the problems are very localized and we need localized data to make those localized policies. Thank you. Well, and to your point just now, and you three are all experts in the groundwater space. And so surely you hear complaints every now and then. I mean, that's sort of part of life, unfortunately. Um, so for each of you, with regards to data, what is the most frequent complaint that you hear about groundwater data? There isn't enough, it's not in the right place, I don't understand it. What are you all hearing? For, and you know, and you have different stakeholders, you're a professor, consultant, public sector. So I'll start with you, Amy. What are the most common complaints that you hear about groundwater data? This is really sad. I got. Um I jumped through the hopes at TDLR to give CEs classes to drillers because the most common complaint that I heard was drillers don't put the right lat long on well logs. Okay. <laughs> fair enough. I was not expecting that, but fair enough. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's crucial, clearly. If we don't, if we don't know where it is, it's, it's useless to us. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Yeah, it seems, seems like that one should be uh, easy to fix, theoretically, uh, in the training space. Joe, what about you? Well, most of my complaints come from students and not from, <laughs> not from well drillers. Uh, but, but I think the, the biggest problem I, I find is that people seem to think that you can drill a well anywhere and get water. And, uh, and if you didn't get water, it's because you didn't drill deep enough or you didn't drill in the right place. 
and they don't realize that in some places the, the water's not available in the way they think it is. And uh, developers seem to have that idea that I could put a development anywhere and I'll have good clean water for everybody and, and they just don't know. Uh, so that's my biggest, that, maybe that's my complaint. <laughs> it can be personal, that's okay. okay. Ashley? Um, so I, most of the complaints or calls that I've received with regards to data is mostly because they um, don't understand what it means. So we'll get calls sometimes about water quality. Well, where's your water quality data? We, we don't handle water quality. Um, so that's a, a big hurdle in itself just to make sure that we're giving the public you know, the right information so they don't call with complaints so they can stay informed. Um, but then another part is they don't know um, units and, and we have an inner report that we require every year. So this basically will give every permittee, we'll get a form, we send them out in December to understand how much water they used in that month, or in that whole year, excuse me. Um, and sometimes we'll get calls, well, I only had it for a week. I'm not doing this form, I don't need it. Well, if it's under our regulations that you actually do need to submit it, even if you owned it for a day. So uh, I feel like a lot of time people wanna keep some of their business private and, and not really wanna give that information, but it does help us stay informed so we can have good decisions. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. Um, and so exactly to that point, Amy, I want to ask you about <clears throat> private, private information being public and privacy, particularly uh, in the groundwater space, which we've been talking before some about management versus private property rights, uh, which is different than in the surface water space. So how does the desire for privacy impact the groundwater data space? And can individual landowner privacy be maintained and the value of the data be maximized? I think you need a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's always a concern. And I think a lot of the districts I deal with have had people come to them and say, I don't want my data out there. I don't want my, and you know, you can redact names and personal information off of things. But in most of the places I work, everybody knows that's Joe's place. <laughs> and so there comes a time when if you're going to, to make those decisions and be able to publish that data, you're going to have to kind of stand against some of that onslaught of you can't do this, you can't do this. Be as sensitive as you can, of course, but um, that data has to be shown, I think, to, to in a, in a not very pointed specific, you know, personal way, but, but you do have to be able to analyze and show your data if you want to be able to make your decisions on it. And is there a, would you say like a, an extent limitation? I'm thinking about how, you know, in the, the health data space, for example, oftentimes, you know, data will be aggregated. So it's effectively anonymized by doing so. And sometimes, you know, spatial data, instead of having the point in a specific location, then it's like, okay, we do a center point for the county and then associate it with that. But in groundwater, as folks have talked about, like the the location is really critical to the analysis and the data. So is groundwater a little bit, in a little bit more of a pickle because of the importance of location or can you, can you fuzzy it a little bit? You can definitely fuzzy it when you're doing averages. You know, some of that line data average stuff, absolutely. But it is an open records entity. If somebody comes in and asks for it, you have to give it to them and people don't like that, but that's the law. And so you can be as sensitive as you can be, but that, that is open data. And yes, once you translate that back out into a map and people know that's Joe's farm, there's not a lot you can do about that, I don't think. And, and maybe the thing that, that I've tried to do before, and I don't know how effective it is, you know, you can say, just because this red spot is on Joe's farm doesn't mean it Joe, it's Joe's farm's causing it. That means that's where we're measuring. We're not measuring next door. So the red spot's what we measure. You know, this is, this is a direct translation of the data we have, not of who's causing it or what the problem is. Right, right, Joe is not the only one. There is behavior that is not captured, it just happens to be captured at that location. Yeah, yeah. thanks Amy. Um, and Joe, question to you. You've noted when we were having conversation prior to the actual um, conference that the groundwater space has historically been data poor, and particularly with regard to spatial data. 
Um, you've also pointed out that groundwater doesn't have the same charismatic touch points like surface water, like piers and intakes and stream beds and all the other things that give us warm fuzzies in this surface water space. So how do you help folks understand what they can't see and how critical it is conveying? You talked about it just a minute ago a little bit, the heterogeneity of aquifers. Uh, the, you ask me really tough questions. Uh, <laughs> that's what makes it good. I know. Um, you know, one of the things that's real obvious is that y you drive by the lake, you can see that it's low. Uh, you can't see the groundwater uh, that's low. And a and, uh, little community that I live in, you know, they, they have a water report or something like But they don't tell us what the water level is in the well. Uh, we don't see a billboard that shows the water level in a well. I mean, closest thing to that I can think of is the Edwards Aquifer, you know, signal well down there for the springs. Uh, but, but we need more visuals like that to, to keep people aware of those things. Um, and and I, I do want to comment on the previous questions a little bit because I found myself thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in a real pickle because I'm going to have to agree with Robert Mace. And, uh, and I, I usually don't do that. And then I'm going to have to agree with Deborah Trejo too, is that the, the data needs to be there so that you can protect your resource. The, the privacy is not going to get you a protected resource of groundwater. Even though it's hidden and you think maybe I want to keep these things private, uh, that's not going to be to everyone's disadvantage. Thank you. And I personally like agreeing with Robert Mace. I don't know if you're still out there. He used to be my boss, best boss. Um, okay, and now Ashley, to you. Um, so one truth about the groundwater data universe that can't really de be debated is it's expanding rapidly. Um, for like pretty much every data context that's out there, we're getting remotely sensed data th through the GRACE satellite and then also, you know, OpenET, which ties groundwater surface water interaction. There are more models coming out, more data sets that are being updated, decision support tools coming out left and right. So how can folks determine what data sources to trust and how does the subsidence district tackle that specific challenge? Yes, so with the subsidence district, not only do we have groundwater data, um, we also collaborate with the USGS to give us our water level data. Um, but we also have subsidence data, which is another piece that many other GCDs really don't have because we regulate groundwater withdrawal to prevent subsidence or the lowering of the land surface elevation due to gr excessive groundwater withdrawals that lead to aquifer compaction. So with a variety of the projects, research projects that we have, um, we are very open and transparent about who our collaborators are. Um, we have every deliverable and publication that we present we give all the references and we're working with universities to have high quality subject matter experts with the best available um, science that we have for our region. Um, and not only do we work with these subject matter experts who have data that can be properly vetted and had the appropriate data quality checks, um, but we also work with stakeholders to understand, to make sure that they understand the process so it's a more collaborative effort. And how critical is stakeholder input to the development, you know, of your research projects and those interactions with universities and others? How do you integrate stakeholders? Yeah, so a great example of this is with our joint regulatory plan review. Um, so this is a chance for the district to look the last time this was done in 2013. And as part of this, we've engaged with stakeholders throughout the whole process. This is a three-year um, project that we have going that will help us inform looking at a variety of aspects do we have enough water to meet future needs? And more importantly, do we have alternate source water so we're not using a lot of groundwater that could lead to subsidence in our area? So we actually have an upcoming stakeholder meeting in September uh, 7th, I believe, or no, excuse me, the 8th <laughs> at 10 a.m. Um, so we've been having these conversations with stakeholders, keeping them aware of these major projects that could impact them along the way. And we do this through our social media and through our website and other outreach measures as well. Awesome. And Amy, how about you? When you're working with various districts, is stakeholder engagement a part of the process or is it highly variable depending on where you are? How does that shape the, the data work that you're doing? Who's mad? <laughs> it's highly variable and somebody has to care first. And, and everybody we work with puts out all of the notices you're supposed to put out and, you know, talks on the radio and does all, you know, whatever all they can do and people just don't show up a lot of times. But if somebody's mad, 
you're going to get a room full. Why does, why do you care? You know, and that's, you have to convince somebody to care. And sometimes it takes somebody getting mad to, to convince people to care. But we do have places where it's a lot of people that, that come together and, you know, upset usually about what are you doing or what are you not doing? And usually somebody on both sides of it. <laughs> and so that's, that's when, um, that's when things can get rough. They can get stressful, they can get high tension, but having been through a lot of that in my past, I also can see in the long run, that's where you really can come to some collaborative answers for, um, you know, what can work for everybody with, with the information that we have on hand. And in those kinds of scenarios where you have mad folks, mad folks on different sides of a particular question, are you able to use data to diffuse the situation? Because I, I think sometimes data can be thought of as like the neutral third party that kind of comes in and is like, okay, well, here's what the data actually show and tell us. Is that a piece of things? That's always my attempt. Um, not everyone finds data as sexy as I do. And so sometimes, you know, if they're mad enough, they don't see that. The attempt, though, is always, this is really what's happening, or as good as we know, you know, this is, this is what's happening, and, and you're saying this, and you're saying this, but you're saying, like the neutral third party, the data says this, and where can we go from here that's going to get us all to the table? That's always the attempt that I, that I, I mean, the districts I work with, I see them all doing that, you know, time and time again. How, how mad are they? <laughs> And that's what it comes down to. How mad are they? And, and, and can you really bring them to the table to look at that data and get a resolution? If that's going to happen, it's the data that's going to do it. Awesome. That's a good plug for data. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to have one final question, and then we'd love to take questions from the audience. And then I have one little thing before we wrap up at the very end. Um, so the last question to everybody. Uh, I want to close out our conversation with... Want your, your last thoughts on, in the Texas groundwater data space, what is the greatest untapped potential? And you don't have to do just one thing. If you want three things, you can have three things. This is a buffet, if you want. So where, where is the untapped potential in Texas groundwater data? Uh, we'll sure. start with oh, Ashley immediately. Yep. Yeah. Up. <laughs> sure, so for me, um, I know when I started at the district, there's just a plethora of data sources and agencies that provide data. And I think an untapped potential would be having a more central repository to have this. I think that could help with outreach of the general public who really knows nothing and needs some guidance on where to go, um, but also could help us as well so we have like a main hub for all of this data that we have. Um, and that would give us great opportunity to collaborate and be able to share and, and have that together. Um, interject shameless plug for the Texas Water Data Hub, which is, aims to be actually exactly what Ashley is describing. Um, at the Texas Water Development Board, in conjunction with lots of folks, we're building a, not a repository because it won't be holding data, but a connection point for Texas water data. That's essentially kind of, you could think of it as a card catalog for water data. So if you want to find data about groundwater, what's available, and then you will be connected to the actual data source. So the, the data from Ashley's district, it doesn't leave Ashley's district, but you'll be able to go to the hub and then connect out. Um, we anticipate a launch of the beta version of that later this fall. Uh, and we, it will really be important to have participation by folks who have data so we can put it, connect it into the hub and, and do exactly that, make it easier for folks to find data on a myriad of topics. Because the previous speaker, he mentioned how data are siloed and somewhat fragmented and the goal is to make the data findable and then accessible so that you can actually access the data and then reuse the data for different purposes. So that original piece that Amy showed in her first slide, the sort of non-sexy version, that's what it'll get you, but it'll allow you to put together various data sources like that to create new tools. So that's, that's the goal. We're still in, in the building phase, but that's where we're headed. Um, so that's great, great news. answer. <laughs> All right, Joe, you're up. Greatest untapped potential. Okay, I don't know if I have a, something that'll lead to a good plug for you or not, 
But I, I would go back to the domestic wells. I think that's the biggest untapped potential we have to get data spatially. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's limited to depth because those are usually shallower wells than some of the others. Uh, and for the deeper wells, uh, I think I, I wish we had better data from the oil and gas industry on the shallow part that goes through the groundwater if we could somehow uh, get them to log that or do some things that, that gave us better data and it was in a hub, uh, that would be a great thing. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. And I appreciate the mini plug. <laughs> All right, Amy, you're up. Fire away. All right, so I already told you. We, we met si on the side, and I was like, I can't answer your last question. There's too many uh, potentials out there. <laughs> but I, I really think every time I come to this question, and I've thought of, I told you, I've thought of this over and over, I don't think that my limitation ever comes to the data. I think the potential that I see is that all this data that's already there, the more accessible it is, the more used it is in, uh, you know, your online um, tools, in apps, in whatever all, you know, that we're coming up with, and the more and more uh, people that we have using this and developing it and doing things with it, I think the more we're going to be able to take the next step and look at what does this tell us, what can we do with this, I mean, it would be awesome to see more groundwater districts be able to do some groundwater analyses because they want to and because they think this would be a great thing to do rather than to meet a bureaucratic deadline. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of data out there that can tell us a lot of things that is just now getting to a point where it can be used and assessed and, and in a way that, that can tell us a lot of things about what do we really want to be doing, where do we really want to end up with this. And I'm excited about all the potential of the next uh, development of use and analysis. Awesome. You know, as you were describing that, Amy, I was thinking that I wonder if part of that will come about as a generational shift. Because when I think about the fact that, you know, pretty much every kid in elementary school this day is, these days is learning to code, you know, so digital natives and data just being part of the fabric of education in a way that it hasn't previously been, that that may also accelerate and facilitate a shift to more uh, data-focused efforts and more, more comfort, you know, because I know it's uh, challenging to learn new tools and new technology and new software, but um, as, the, as those things are more uh, typical and customary for folks, it, it may make that kind of transition that you're describing a little easier. Absolutely. My kids are going to eat all this up. Yeah, <laughs> mine too. Awesome. Okay, so questions from the audience or the magical app? Okay. I'm a data nerd too. I live and die by it. Uh, 40 to 50 hours um, in a public agency generating research data and building a lifestyle for my family with it. And then when I get home, I take off that hat and put on my private sector hat as a real estate agent to help my wife. And I can easily imagine when th these data come online, if I'm a buyer's agent looking at that property that shows up in the red spot on your graph, on your chart, on your map, I'm suddenly counseling them as a fiduciary to offer $30,000 less for that property, which sucked $30,000 out of the pocket of the landowner. So I'm wondering if perhaps we might think about how to conceive of policy environments and fiscal backup environments that we should build before rushing to put these kinds of beautiful, beautiful data out there that actually affect have the potential to affect individuals right in the bottom line. Can we do that? Is it possible? That's what I'm asking. What, what kind of uh, financial and, and uh, that kind of data do you want us to have out there first and develop? I'd like for us to have a policy environment that understands that when that landowner puts his or her property on the market and these data that he or she did not really have a hand in making available, but it sucked $30,000 out of his or her pocket. I'd just like to see, I'd like to know if, if it's possible to build a policy environment that cushions the financial blow that people actually experience from data that we eggheaded. I'm an egghead, a public egghead. And I can play fast and loose with data, and it sucks money out of people's pockets. 
I'm wondering if we can address that at some point. Do you think? Well, I would say we have a legislative panel tomorrow, and those are the folks who have the ability to, re they're the ones who set the policy environment. Um, I don't know that any of us have the, that kind of authority, but your, your point is very well taken that there are very real and economic impacts to individuals based on what's happening in an area. And that's, that's nothing to scoff at, but in terms of creating a policy environment that it sounds like would allow for some form of compensation based on what the data are showing. Uh, yeah, that's outside of our wheelhouse, but a, a valuable question to ask. Could I? Sure. I, I have a little different response to that. Um, in some cases, uh, that property's uh, probably worth thirty thousand dollars less, uh, and so that's not a something that sucked out of there. It's just uh, somebody didn't get built out of paying too much for a property. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, there, there's the flip side of that. So I, I, I understand what you're saying that you know the data needs to be careful, and and we need some some guidelines maybe on doing that. But I think what we've got now is. Uh, we've got a lot of people that just don't know, and they're being sold property that, that the, the water data would help them have a more fair value of that. So, so I see that just a little bit differently, but then I'm a, at a university, so I don't really know the real world. I, yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. I agree with that also, and, and I've dealt with uh, people coming in. I, one of the first, I'm trying to think of the PC way to say this, the first grapping out that I took as a public employee at a groundwater conservation district was from a landowner who came in and I mean chewed and cussed and railed at me because my district did not search her out and tell her before she bought property that there was not enough water under it for her to have house water. That's the first chewing that I took. I can't make somebody come ask me the questions. <laughs> right, right. Well, in, a, in our agency, I work across groundwater, flood, surface water, and in the, the flood space, there is more of a regulatory environment that requires disclosure about what your risk is. And so what you're speaking to is there being an accurate representation of, you know, the, the risk and what the resources are available there. So it's, you know, more hidden and occult in the groundwater space, but uh, still sort of similar concept. Do we have other questions? I can repeat it. Okay. Uh, how do you teach staff and end users how to use and navigate interactive maps? And I think that kind of came in when Ashley was talking about some of their work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you teach staff and end users how to navigate maps and online applications? Ashley, you want to take that? Yes, so one of the methods that we have used is um, for the city works in general, we have these user guides, which we put on our website, which is basically a PowerPoint to show you all the clicks and highlights, but we've recently released um, a video. So there is a person describing, click here and then do this. Um, with regards to the interactive map, we have um, an info button. It's an, it's an eye with a circle around it. I think that's pretty universal, um, similar to like the question mark in a circle, um, that will give you step by step how you do this, like step one, click click here and do that. So we've tried a combination of things um, depending on what type of learner you are, but usually it's just very visually based of here, click here and here are your next steps. Well, speaking of shameless plugs, I train people to do that if you need that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And the power of a video. That's huge.